Hi, I'm Carrie Reed, Environmental Horticulture Advisor with UC Cooperative Extension, and I'm standing here today in the beautiful Fair Oaks Horticulture Center, the entrance to their water efficient landscape, to talk to you about building resilient gardens. What is a resilient garden? Well, it's one that can weather changes gracefully. Now, these could be the expected seasonal changes, but also those unexpected changes like California's periodic droughts unexpected pest invasions, or those drastic temperature swings that we had recently. Why is it so important to build a resilient garden? Well, you put a lot of time and you put a lot of money into it, and when you do that, you don't want to lose plant material and waste all that effort. We all know that a resilient garden, a beautiful garden, adds value to your property. It gives you a sense of pride and ownership, but it also just gives you a sense of well-being when you spend time in that garden. So we're gonna give you a few simple steps today that you can use to build a resilient garden. So the first step in building a resilient garden is to really start with the soil. You wanna build resilience from the ground up. So what makes a healthy soil? There's two important aspects of a healthy soil and the first one is pore space. You really need to have all of these little fine openings throughout the soil that allow both moisture and oxygen into the root zone, which is what plants need. The second thing you need is organic matter. Organic matter is what feeds soil microorganisms and feeding the soil microorganisms is critical to a resilient garden. Those little microorganisms that you don't see, and there are millions of them in the soil, they actually help suppress detrimental organisms in the soil, and they help break down the mineral particles in soil so it releases those nutrients to your plants, as well as it keeps those soil pores open by creating these humic acids. So it's really critical that you have lots of good organic matter within your soil. Now, the way that you get that organic matter in there, first of all, is by adding some compost. So when you're preparing a new garden bed, you want to make sure that you're adding some really good organic compost into the soil. And you're going to want to either rototill this in or dig it in. Now, how do you tell if a compost is a good product? You can buy compost in bags and you can buy a lot of products that call themselves compost. But when you examine a compost, and I'm just, I've got a little baggie here of what I would call a good compost. It's going to be a product that's completely decomposed and you shouldn't be able to tell what it was before. So you don't want to see big twigs in there. You don't want to see big leaves in there. So whether you're making a homemade compost or whether you're buying one, you want it to look completely decomposed like soil and it should have a good smell. So if you smell this bag, it smells like you're walking through a forest floor. It doesn't smell like rotten eggs or like something else that's decomposing. So that's what you want is a really good high quality compost. And you can buy these in bags sometimes, but inspect them. Or you can uh, go to a landscape supply product place and walk through the yard and really look at what their products are and make sure that if you're buying it by the yard, for instance, that what you're getting is the kind of product that you want. Now, in order for it to be significant enough to actually change the soil, you need to think about adding 25% organic matter mulch, or compost rather, to the soil. So that means three inches incorporated to a depth of about a foot. And you can either do that by digging it in or you can do it with a rototiller, as I said. But you wanna make sure that you completely cover the area that you're going to be replanting. You don't want to just put it in one little hole. If you put the compost in just the little hole that you're going to plant, you create too cushy of an environment for that potted plant and it doesn't want to move out into the soil. And you want the roots to move out into the soil because you want them to have access to as much root volume as they can, as much soil, so they have a lot of access to water and a lot of access to nutrients. I often say that Putting compost in a pot is like making it too easy on your teenagers. If you make it too easy, they won't move out. So you need to kind of make sure that whatever you add, you're adding to the entire planting bed that you're going to convert. So once you've got all of that incorporated in, the next thing in order to keep that good soil profile going is to cover it with a blanket of mulch. Now, mulch is just anything that you put on the surface of the soil. So you could put compost on the surface and that would be a mulch, but compost is best used 
as an amendment that you incorporate in. Mulch, to be a good mulch, you need a nice thick layer, and it can be any organic material. So you don't have to buy the most expensive, beautiful, even big bark chunks. You can even use just fresh tree chips from a tree company that's clearing trees in your house. I mean, in your neighborhood, you can just have them come and, and put it on your driveway and use it. So you can see in the beds here that what they've used is from the parks around here where whatever trees get cut down, they chip them, shred them, and then just lay them on the soil surface. So putting a nice thick layer of at least two inches, but three is better and four if you have space around big trees is even better. This accomplishes a lot of things for you. First of all, it's going to keep those pore spaces open and the soil won't get hit by the sun and, and turn hard and crusted and become difficult for water to penetrate. The second thing that it does for you is it keeps the soil underneath it a nice even temperature and roots love that. They love to have a nice even temperature. It's really stressful for them to get too hot or too cold. And the same is true for those soil microorganisms you encouraged by putting all that compost in there. So that acts like an insulating blanket. Added benefit, it suppresses weeds. And whatever weed seeds do fl fly in from your neighbors, they're gonna be really easy to pull because they're gonna be shallowly rooted. Now I wanna discourage you from using landscape fabric in a planted bed. And that's because although it may keep the weeds suppressed in the beginning, it also prevents that mulch from making contact with the soil surface. And when it makes contact with the soil surface, it slowly will decompose and add to that nice richness of the soil that you're trying to develop. Now, if you have a particularly weedy bed that you are uh, trying to convert and turn into a really good landscape bed, you can use, instead of the landscape fabric that doesn't decompose, you can use sheets of cardboard or even six to eight sheets of newspaper underneath the mulch, and that will suppress those weeds for the first year or so, but then it will also decompose and become part of that soil profile so that you get the added benefits of the mulch as it decomposes. So you want to make sure that you've added a lot of good compost and you've covered the surface with the mulch. Now you want to be careful that up next to tree trunks, you don't put a, what we sometimes call a volcano of mulch. You don't want to pile it up next to tree trunks because that creates an environment that's too moist around tree trunks and it can cause trunk rot. So you'll want to be sure that you keep it two to three inches away from the base of the trunk flare where trees are planted. But these are the two steps that you're going to want to do to create that resilient soil that's going to be a really happy environment for the new plants that you're going to be putting in. Now that you've got your soil all prepared, the next step is the fun part. That's the plants. Your motto is going to be right plant, right place. How do you tell if a plant is right? Well, there are several things you can do, and we're going to talk about those next. Okay, so how do you find out if a plant is right for your area? You want to make sure that you understand your climate zone. And there are two different types of climate zones that you need to be concerned about. The first one is what we call a USDA hardiness climate zone. And almost every plant tag in a nursery is going to give you a zone on it. That's going to be the USDA hardiness zone. All that tells you is that the plant will or won't freeze in your area. That's not always our greatest concern here. So there's this other kind of a climate zone called a sunset climate zone. And that gives you a lot more information about our maximum high temperatures, how humid it is in your particular area, and some of those other fine sort of climatic factors that affect whether or not a plant is gonna be successful. So when you're out shopping, how do you know if a plant is in your sunset climate zone? And if you're in the Sacramento region, you're gonna be in the USDA zone 9B, and you're gonna be in one of two sunset climate zones, either 14 or nine. And in order to find out whether a plant that you're shopping for is actually going to be suitable to your climate area, you can look it up in something like this, the Sunset Western Garden Book. This is sometimes referred to as the gardener's Bible, and it's a really handy resource. They're not expensive, but I'll tell you a little secret. Almost every garden center you go into is going to have one of these behind the counter. So if you aren't sure about a plant, whether or not it's gonna succeed in your area, 
ask them to look it up in the Sunset Western Garden book that's behind the counter and find out because it's going to list all the sunset climate zones. So if your 9 or your 14 isn't listed there, you want to avoid buying that plant because it's just going to be a disappointment to you and you're going to end up with some plant failure. So the second thing you want to think about is, is it suited to your soil type? So no matter whether you've added organic matter or not, you still have a soil type. And in our area, if that could be anything from sandy loam to heavy clay, if you're up in the foothills or a little further out in the valley. And if you're looking at a plant tag in the nursery and it says it needs good drainage, you're going to be really disappointed if you plant that at the bottom of a hill that stays moist. That plant needs to be planted maybe on a mound, or maybe you need to plant it up on the side of a hill, or maybe build a raised bed for it. But whatever you do, make sure that you're matching those soil requirements to what that plant is suitable for. And again, if it's not on the plant tag, that's also something that you can check for in your handy Sunset Western Garden book. There's also an app that you have on your, that you can download on your phone for free, and that has some of the same information in it that you can use as you're walking through the garden center. So the climate zone and the soil type need to be suitable for this area. So once you have those things down, the next thing that you want to think about is uh, whether or not that plant is going to be water conserving. So in California, our periodic droughts and our water restrictions are with us to stay. And so it's really important when you're looking for plants to build a resilient garden that you look for those that are going to be maybe drought tolerant, but at least moderate to low water using plants. And finding out whether or not a plant is a low water user can be tricky. You can't always just trust the labels, unfortunately, because a lot of those labels come from uh, the Midwest where they get summer rain, or the Northeast, and their climate is very different than ours. So you're gonna wanna make sure that you check. Now there's a website that you can look up that has all of the water use classifications of the plants that you're gonna use in California. And that can be looked up on, just by putting in your Google bar, WUCALS, W-U-C-O-L-S, Roman numeral four. And that will pop up that database. And that is a great searchable online database that will tell you whether a plant is a low, moderate, or high water user. Sometimes you can find that information in book sources, but that is your best bet. So we're gonna have a link for that for you and you'll be able to use that. Now, there's some characteristics that you can look for in plants that are going to give you clues to whether or not they are low water using plants. And these characteristics can be sort of guides for you, cues as you're walking through the nursery to see whether or not those plants are low water users. So there, uh, the first characteristic of leaves would be small. Little small leaves have less surface area. Less surface area means less evaporation of water from the surface. So things like rosemary that have these little tiny needle-like leaves, they're very good low water use plants. They don't lose their water at all. There are other characteristics like on the salvias that we have here that are gray, gray leaves, fuzzy leaves. These are light colored and they reflect light. And when they reflect light, they reflect heat which reduces, again, their need for moisture in the summertime. Another characteristic that some plants have is that they will hold their leaves vertically like this. So instead of being flat, where the sun will hit the surface and cause them to evaporate more water, those leaves are held vertically. Some of our native manzanitas do this. The Australian bottle brushes do this. And you'll see some other plants in the nursery like germander that also have these vertically held leaves. And that means that in the middle of the hot sun, their leaves are not being struck by the sun and so they don't lose as much moisture. Now there's another characteristic that is um, really a, a cool, cool thing to figure out and that is crunchy leaves. Leaves that are crunchy like on this native toyon, but you might also think of bay leaves or our native oaks and even camellias, which if they're planted in the shade are actually quite low water use. And leaves that are very crunchy like this have a waxy coating on their surface that keeps them from evaporating water. So these are clues and cues that you have 
that these plants might be water conserving. And then of course, we have succulents like um, agaves and yuccas and cacti and different kinds of plants that are succulent. And those are ones that most people are familiar with and think about. But be careful with some succulents in our area, they actually prefer a little bit of afternoon shade. So you'll wanna make sure also when you're reading labels, if a plant is gonna be right for your area, that you notice whether or not it needs full sun or part sun or part shade, because these things will cause you to be really disappointed if you plant them in the wrong area. And one final type of plant to think about adding is bulbs. Bulbs are fantastic additions to the garden. They're seasonal. They usually will pop up with spring color. A lot of them will then, their leaves will die down. That way they don't need a lot of water during the summertime, but they can add a lot of cheer. So even think of things like daffodils or Peruvian lilies or a lot of our native iris or some of the even non-native irises are actually quite water conserving. And when you think about it, they have those vertically held leaves and they're usually kind of crunchy. So these are the kind of characteristics that you're gonna to wanna to look at when you're trying to find plants that are water conserving. Now, water conservation isn't the only thing to look for. You're going to wanna to read plant labels and find out how big a plant is going to be when it's mature. And you can pretty much count on, in California, it's gonna grow bigger than the label, especially if the plant is from somewhere else because we have this nice long growing season, we have warm fall temperatures, early springs, and so at least as big as what it says on the label and maybe up to 50% bigger for plants that come from back east. So you do not want to buy plants that need to be pruned in order to keep them to a right space. So if you need a plant for underneath your windows, buy something that tops out at four feet. Don't buy something that's going to need to be hedged constantly. Hedging is really hard on plants and it opens up a wound every time you make a cut. And that wound is an access point for disease and an access point for pests that can come in. So it weakens the plants and makes them the opposite of what you're looking for, which is a resilient plant. So again, look for plants whose mature size fits the planting space that you have planned for it. The final thing that I want to point out to you when you're looking for plants for the garden is to think about planting things for the beneficial wildlife, the birds, the bees, the butterflies, and the beneficial insects, the four bees. So you wanna think about having lots of flowers over a long flowering season. You're gonna to wanna to have tubular flowers, which uh, the hummingbirds love. You're gonna to wanna to have open-faced flowers, which the butterflies find easy to access. And then you wanna have a season of flowering that starts early and goes all the way through. We can grow things with flowers all the way into the winter here. And you wanna make sure that you also have shelter. So by planting some ornamental grasses that don't get cut down during the winter, you provide a place for those beneficials like ladybugs that we all love to see in our garden to stay. Now we all know that you can buy ladybugs in the garden center and they seem cute. But when you bring ladybugs home, they're gonna stay about 48 hours. And because they have a homing sense, they're gonna leave your property. They might clean up 20% of your aphids in that time, but they're not gonna be your ladybugs next year. So what you wanna do is make sure that you're planting things where those ladybugs can spend the winter. And they love having those tightly packed leaves that you get in ornamental grasses. So having two or three of those around your property is a real asset. By doing this, what you do is you set up an environment that allows pest control to take place naturally and you don't need to come in with chemical insecticides into your garden. And I want to strongly discourage you, if you're building a resilient garden, avoid chemical pesticides because you set up a system then that causes you to constantly need them. But if you have lots of flowering things and shelter for the beneficials, what you do is set up your own pest control. And don't forget to put out a few little dishes of water or a bird bath here and there for not just the birds, but also for the lizards, which will eat pest insects, and for the butterflies and for the bees. They all like to have a little water. So make sure that you're selecting plants that are right for your area, the right size, lots of food and shelter for the beneficial organisms, and plants that are gonna be water conserving and resilient in your area. So once you've selected your plants, your soil is all prepared, 
The next thing is to make sure that what the plants that you're buying from the nursery are healthy plants. Now there are a few things you can do and I'm going to give you a little bit of a trick here when you're at the garden center. I don't want you to start jerking plants out of the pots and dropping potting soil all over the garden center because you're going to make people angry. But you can do a little slide and you're just going to grab the plant. I'm going to flip this around. Grab the plant at the crown and gently pull it from the pot so that you can inspect the roots. And what you're going to, if now this is a big pot, you're going to have to sit it on the ground and sort of tilt it slightly and gently try to pull. What you're looking for are white roots, nice, white, healthy roots. Plants that have been in the pot too long can end up with rotten roots and you'll end up with black instead of white. And plants that haven't been potted up long enough may fall apart when you try to pull them out. And those can be especially difficult to plant when you get home because those little fine roots can get broken really easily. So once you've gotten the plant home, um, well, another thing to check for is make sure you don't have any bugs, no critters that are hitchhiking home with you. Sometimes these come from the nursery and you can see right away whether or not you've got some little eggs growing and make sure there's no diseased leaves, obviously um, dying leaves on the plants that you're buying. But when you get the plant home and you've uh, pulled it out and you've decided you're ready to plant, never dig your hole before you look at the plant and pull it out. Once you've pulled it out, now you can see how deep you should dig your hole. You never want to dig a hole deeper than the root ball of the plant. Because what happens is all of this organic potting medium that comes with a plant from the nursery decomposes pretty rapidly. And when that decomposes, the plant sinks. And when it sinks, then it ends up being below the soil grade and then water collects and you end up rotting your plant. So you don't want to do that. So you want to find out how deep is my plant. And then you're going to dig the hole just as deep, but twice as wide so that you've got a little bit of loose soil around the outside, but you want this sitting on nice firm ground just a bit above soil grade. Now, if I'm planting a five gallon woody shrub or even a 15 gallon tree, you're going to want that to be quite a bit above soil grade when you dig that hole. So maybe even as much as an inch above grade because there's a lot of organic potting medium to decompose. And especially with woody plants, you don't want those uh, sinking below grade because that sets up that trunk rotting that can happen when water collects near it if the plant develops um, a little pool around it. So when you look at a plant like this, I'll just confess this one's been in the pot just a little bit too long, even though it's still healthy and has some good roots. But what I would probably do is take my, my hand shears, which hopefully you have a pair, and you can see there's a sharp side and there's a dull side, a rounded side. And you can just take that rounded side and gently tease the roots away from the edge where they're really sort of stuck in from being in the pot just a bit too long. And when you do that, you give the plant a little bit of a head start for growing out into the soil where you're going to be planting it. So once you've done that and you've dug your hole a little bit shallower or certainly no deeper than the root ball and twice as wide, you'll place your plant where it's supposed to go and pull that soil that you've amended already back over it. Now, I will say this, if you are only replacing one or two plants and you don't have the opportunity to add compost and incorporate it into the entire area, remember that you're not going to want to add compost just to that section. So you'll just be putting native soil back over it. But if you've been able to amend it, you'll put your soil back over around it, snug it up, and don't be afraid to really firm that soil around the root ball. You want good contact of the native soil with the roots. Now, if you weigh 250, I don't want you jumping up and down on the root ball because you will break things. But you can even use your foot to, to, to tamp it down and make sure you have good soil contact. Once that happens, you wanna make sure you water it in thoroughly. And a lot of people like to build a little berm, as we call it, or a little, a little ridge around the outside, especially of a tree, so that you can hold water there, and that's fine. But if you do, make sure that that little berm stays no longer than one year. You want to remove it after that first establishment period. Because if you don't, you will end up 
holding water next to the trunk, and that sets up that trunk rotting uh, system that we were talking about before. So after you've done that, you've watered it in well, you're going to pull your mulch back over, and you are well on your way to a resilient garden. So here we are in the midst of the hot summer, and I want to say this is not the best time to do your planting, but this is a great time to be doing your planning. So this is the time to prepare your soil and do your shopping and plan out what it is that you want to plant so that you can go into the fall, the months of September and October is the perfect time to be doing this. So remember these steps. Prepare your soil properly. Make sure that you're planning for plants that are appropriate to your site, to your climate, and providing for the beneficial wildlife. And then plant carefully, establishing those plants, giving them a really good head start this fall. That way they'll be able to take advantage of that nice fall and winter rain, and they'll be ready for the following summer with a resilient garden that you should be able to get great enjoyment out of for many years to come.